Uh, we're describing events that took place uh, between the third Passover and the beginning of the fourth Passover in Jesus' public ministry. And during this final phase, Jesus was spending, you know, he was spending more time in and around Jerusalem, going into the city to teach, and then returning north when things became a little too hot, a little too tense, too dangerous for him. That was the pattern that he held to uh, all the way through his ministry, actually. So when we pick up the story this week, the Lord has been um, in the far north and in the west ministering and teaching, but there are some important feasts that are coming up in the city of Jerusalem, and he will have to leave the relative safety of his home area and venture back into Jerusalem to teach, and of course to declare the true nature of his personhood and also what his ministry is all about, but he, because he came to tell them who he was, that the Messiah was here. And I think the whole idea was he had to do it in measured, you know, in, in a measured way, because too much, too quickly, uh, they would have been overwhelmed. They were overwhelmed anyways with what he was doing. So we're going to start with event number 82. And no, event number 82 describes one such dynamic appearance in Jerusalem during the feast Feast of Tabernacles, another, some Bibles say the Feast of Booths. So Jesus at Jerusalem during the Feast of Tabernacles, John chapter seven, verses one to 52 or 53. Now Tabernacles was a feast that commemorated several things. Uh, the blessings of harvest, as well as the time spent in the desert during the Exodus. And there were special or several features of this feast. For example, the name booths or tabernacle comes from the booths that were made of tree boughs and branches um, that, uh, that all of them had to uh, live in during the uh, seven days of the feast. Uh, it was one of the three annual feasts that every male had to attend. Not the females, but the males had to attend. Um, it came at the end of fall. It was a time of, actually a time of celebrating. Um, and it commemorated the time that they were in the, in the desert and they had to live, you know, they were wandering, they had to live, not, they didn't live in houses. Interesting thing in Montreal, <coughs> I remember there's a, a considerable uh, Jewish population in Montreal and um, uh, uh, they would, the, the Jews in Montreal, those who celebrated, continue to celebrate, that, would build the booth out on their porches, like a tent. And they'd build the booth out, in the, out on their porches or out on their backyard during this year. And the reason that this came to attention was that there started to be complaints from landlords who, you know, who owned these uh, expensive apartment buildings where Jewish people lived, and they were complaining that they were building these ugly booths, you know, these, these, these little forts or whatever, on their balconies. And it took away from the prestige of the, uh, you know, of the apartment building or, or the neighborhood and so on and so forth. And I remember that was a, an argument or a debate. Uh, it went to court and so on and so forth. But they still celebrate that uh, to this day. Now anyways, during this time uh, Jesus is in Galilee and this is where his brothers taunt him to come to the feast to prove himself if he really is the Messiah. And it says, you know, because his brothers didn't believe in him. His own brothers didn't believe in him. And of course he refuses to, actually he doesn't refuse to go to the feast, he refuses to be provoked by them. If he's going to go to the feast it's not going to be because they provoked him on a dare. Why don't you go? If you're such hot stuff, why don't you go to Jerusalem? Show yourself. So he's not going to be pulled into action based on their taunts or their provocation. Whatever he does, he does according to the will of the Father. And so uh, the Bible tells us a little later on he goes, but secretly. Now while he's there, he observes that people have a divided opinion about him. Some say he's evil, some say he's an imposter, some say he's a good man. There's confusion. And to clarify their opinion, he stands up publicly and he begins to teach the crowds on several occasions. And it's during this period, this, this occasion here, 
where he accuses them of trying to kill him, the one, has, the one who has brought them the teaching of God. Yeah, I mean, his, his logic was unassailable. I'm bringing you the teaching of God. You're supposed to be the people of God. Why do you want to kill me? You know, they had no answer for that. He says that he is sent directly from God. Um, he also says that where I am, you cannot come. And then he also says, let him come to me and drink. So he makes all these messianic statements about his true character, his true personhood, and that doesn't calm everything, it actually stirs everything up. So all of his references are to declare that he is from God, equal to God, and for this reason the religious leaders send soldiers to arrest him. But what happens? Anybody know? What happens to the soldiers? They go to arrest him. Exactly, that's what they say. They don't arrest them, they come back and they say to their leaders, well, well you didn't arrest them? No, why? Well, nobody ever spoke like this. You know, they're amazed. So when the soldiers come back empty-handed, there's, there's a dispute among the leaders, at which time Nicodemus tries to defend Jesus, but he's put down by the, he's put down by the other leaders. And what was, anybody remember, what was the question you know, there was, there was division among them on a, on, a, on a point of doctrine, or not doctrine, but on a point of, of scripture. What were the leaders saying? What was their defense? It was a pretty flimsy one. He can't be the Messiah. Forget the miracles. Forget the fact that He raises people from the dead. Forget that He speaks in a way no one has ever spoken before. Put all that aside. He can't be the Messiah because He comes from Galilee. He comes from Choctaw. You know, you know I mean, he, he, where is he supposed to come from? Well, he's supposed to come from Bethlehem. He's supposed to be a descendant of David, and he was, and he did, and he was born there, but they didn't, they didn't know this particular history of Jesus. But imagine, they deny the miracles, they deny the resurrection of the, from the dead of people that, he, that Jesus raised from the dead. They deny all of the signs and wonders on one flimsy little thing. Well, he, he, he came from the wrong town. We're not sure what town he comes from. All right, event number 83, Jesus and the adulteress. John chapter eight, verses one to 11. So the Lord leaves the temple area and he goes to the Mount of Olives next to the temple area and there is a park there where um, he um, will later pray the Mount of Olives, uh, uh, at the top of the hill, Mount of Olives is a grove of olive trees, and at the top there's a park there where, um, and I think I mentioned it in this class, where travelers would pause before they'd go down the valley and back up to the, the holy city. So he goes up there to pray, spends the night, and then he returns to the temple the next day. So the Pharisees try a new line of attack, this time trying to turn the people against him. They've tried to themselves denounce him, or trick him, or try to perhaps arrest him. And they're seeing that this isn't working. So they're going to say, well, why not turn the people against him? If the people can be against him, then we'll have an, we'll have an advantage. So what do they do? They do this by bringing him a woman caught in an adulterous affair, and they ask him what to do with her. And if you've been in classes where John was taught, uh, or where this passage is taught, you know that there's, something must be up, that they actually caught a woman in adultery. You know, it sounds right away that this was a put up job. And they, you know, they ask him, what should we do with her? And of course, if he says, well, stone her according to the Mosaic law, well, they'll accuse him of being unmerciful and even breaking the law, breaking Roman law, because Jews were not allowed to execute anyone. They, they didn't have the permission uh, for capital punishment um, unless they uh, were given permission by the Roman uh, governor. That's why they brought Jesus to Pilate, because they themselves, do you think for a second they would have brought him to Pilate if they themselves had the right to execute him? I mean, he would have been dead and gone. So if he says, you know, yes, stone her, well now they have a way to accuse him in front of the Romans. If he says, well, let her go, well then they'll accuse him of being a liberal. 
and that'll turn the people against him. So he turns the tables on them by challenging them with the idea of who is truly worthy of being this woman's judge anyways. You're asking me to judge her. So he just says, why don't you judge her? And here's the criteria for judgment. What's the criteria for judgment? Who doesn't have any sin? If you don't have any sin, you, yeah. If you don't have any sin, go ahead, judge her. Throw the first stone. Let he who is without sin cast the first stone. So when they realize that according to law and conscience, none of them are worthy to judge her, regardless of her guilt or innocence, they leave. And then Jesus, here's the point, Jesus who is worthy to judge, He doesn't have any sin. He's the Lord. He is the judge. He can be the judge. What does He do? He forgives her. He releases her and he encourage her, encourages her not to sin in this way any longer. To the crowd he proves his unassailable wisdom, and to the woman he demonstrates in private the mercy of God. Marvelous, marvelous story. Uh, event number 84, Jesus teaches again in the temple, John 8, 12 to 59. So once the meeting with the woman is over, Jesus again begins to teach the crowds concerning his identity, and he responds to their questions. And what does he say in this section? I am the light of the world. While I am going, where I am going, you cannot come. When you lift up the Son of Man, you will know that I am He. If you abide in my word, you are truly disciples of mine. You are, your father's, uh, you are of your father the devil, and then especially the, the hardest hitting one, before Abraham was, I am. The great I am statement. So these and other teachings concerning his true identity as the divine Son of God and Messiah provoke them to such frenzy that they take up stones and they try to kill him on the spot. And so you know, what's interesting here is that <clears throat> the Pharisees, through trickery, try to get the people to turn on him and they can't do it. And then just in the next episode, the next event, Jesus with His own words stirs them up to such frenzy that now they want to kill. The Pharisees can't do it. And I'm not saying Jesus was doing this in order to provoke their anger to kill Him. It's simply that the truth that He spoke was just overwhelming them. And it was overwhelming them because they didn't believe. If they believed, then okay, they, they, they can enter into that faith. But if you don't believe, then what he's saying is punishable by death. Number 85, Jesus heals the blind beggar. John chapter nine, a long passage, verses one to 41. So Jesus is, remember all these events here are just, they're just following one after another. He leaves the temple area for safety's sake, and they want to kill him but he continues to minister in that general area. So here he heals a man blind from birth, and when this fact is presented to the Jewish leaders, they accept that the miracle is genuine, but they continue to reject Jesus. And this was significant for two reasons. One, the healing of a blind person was, had never been done before, and it was a definitive sign that Jesus was the Messiah and they rejected this clear demonstration. What did John the Baptist say, uh, excuse me, what did Jesus answer to John the Baptist when John the Baptist was in prison and he said, you know, are you the one or should we expect another? You know, he, his faith was wavering and Jesus answers him. And what did he say? What was one of the things, one of the signs that he said? The, that's right, the blind sea. John, of course, knowing the word of God understood. If the blind see, that was a sign. That miracle had never been done. And then secondly, the healing was a, what's called a living parable. A living parable that pointed to their own blindness in the spiritual world and how God was opening the eyes of the simple and shutting the eyes of the proud. In the Old Testament, many of the prophets 
would, do, would have uh, living examples, like uh, in order to, they wouldn't always say something. You know, uh, they would, uh, some, one of them would take a, 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 a pot, for example, a jar, you know, and would break it, you know, uh, as a demonstration, a living parable of what God was going to do to the nation, all right? Or, tie, or, or uh, when Agabus, the prophet, came and he tied a belt around himself and he said, this is how, saying to Paul, this is how, you know, this is your future, a living parable. Well, this miracle here, the healing of the blind, this was a living parable, but directed at the, at the leaders. This simple beggar, he was regaining his sight. He had no torque, this guy. He had no, he had no stature. He had nothing, he was the lowest of the low, and yet to him, God gave sight. And to you, the leaders, who say you see, who say you're the leaders, his, his awakening, this miracle, demonstrated how blind you were, a living, a living parable. So this sign was a judgment directly on the Jewish leaders and teachers who should have seen but they didn't. You know, a lot of times you hear people say, well, it's anti-Semitic if you say the Jews killed Jesus. You ever hear that? People say that all the time. You know, Ben, you can't do that. That's wrong. You know, that's being prejudiced. Well, it's not being prejudiced. It's history. You know, I'm not blaming the present generation for having killed Jesus, but certainly the Jewish leaders, certainly them, they were in collusion with the Roman leaders at the time to affect the death of Christ. That's history. That's not being prejudiced in any way. All right, number 86, Jesus' discourse on the Good Shepherd. John chapter 10, verses 1 to 21. I preached a sermon on this a few weeks ago. His final teaching in the temple area before returning north after the feast was, um, uh, was over. Uh, uh, was over uh, concerning the idea of him being the Good Shepherd. In other words, the final, the final uh, dialogue that he has with the people is the fact that he is the Good Shepherd. So he's plainly declared who he was and that his time was at hand and now he's forcing the people to choose who they will follow. All the things follow. Well, I'm going to ask somebody to just walk over to that thermostat, please, and <laughs> click it off. <laughs> I see all our ladies putting, <laughs> ready to put on coats here. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Does it need to be 69 degrees in this uh, room? Oh, thank you. It's, e it's even annoying the teacher. <laughs> so all of these events, all of these events are taking place one after another in the temple, in the temple area, and so on and so forth. And all of these lead to this climactic point where Jesus declares, I'm the good shepherd. Now, shepherds in, in, in Israel, this was a common visual, a common thing. But when Jesus is talking about shepherds, he's talking about the leadership, the leadership of Israel at that time. He denounces them through the miracle of giving sight to the blind beggar. And then in the end, he declares, I'm the good shepherd. You know, showing that there's a good shepherd and if there's a good shepherd, there may be a bad shepherd. And what you see between the lines is that he's the good shepherd, they're the bad shepherds. And so he's the good shepherd. Those who follow him will be following the correct leader. And this was a direct rebuke to the Jewish leaders that were leading at the time. That's simple for us today. You know, we're thinking, yeah, of course, Jesus, you know, blah, blah, blah. But if you lived in that society, the Jewish leaders, they're the ones that lived in the big houses. They're the ones that controlled government. They're the ones with the majestic robes and they're the ones who led in worship and they're the ones who had prestige and they're the ones who had money. And they were the ones who taught. They were the leaders in the synagogues and at the temple. They're the ones that had the history, the lineage. You know, people say, well, my father was an elder and my grandfather was a preacher and an elder. My great-grandfather was, a, you know, you, know the, you hear people say that. Well, these men were saying, you know, we go back a thousand years. And so for this itinerant preacher from the north, from nowhere, who comes to Jerusalem and says, I'm the good shepherd. 
You know, me, I have no money, no place to stay, I have no prestige, <laughs> you know, I have no, I have nothing. But I'm the good shepherd. It's me you have to follow. Boy, that was, that was something. So it's interesting to note that after this final speech and invitation to follow him, there was still division over him. Some believed he was possessed, others who knew about the healing of the blind man were impressed, not necessarily convinced, I don't know what, what it would have taken. Yet with all the teaching and miracles, there was doubt and division as the people just wouldn't make up their minds. Number 87, the final departure from Galilee to Jerusalem, Luke chapter 9, verses 51 to 62. Now, there's no transitional explanation of Jesus leaving Jerusalem and going back up north. You know, nobody says, and then He left, and then He went up north, and then He stayed, and then He came. There's no transitional thing here. There's simply no more teaching from the temple area, and the very next scene finds him back in Galilee between the fall feast of booths and the winter feast of dedication. So you're assuming, okay, he, you know, he went back north. So at this point we see him preparing yet for another trip to Jerusalem, once again to teach at the temple. Things have cooled down and he's planning to return. And so during this trip there are some who want to go with him and it is here that he warns them about the cost of discipleship. You know, the, the man said, let me bury my father first, you know, and so on and so forth. And Jesus says, let the dead bury the dead. So at this point, there's some that, that want to follow him. I'll follow, you know, the ones who are his disciples, the ones who have been listening, saying, okay, I'm in. But first, I got to do this, I got to do that. He said, no, no, no. If you're in, let's go. So discipleship you know, is a serious business and Jesus warns that those who put the hand to the plow and look back are not fit for the kingdom of God. All right, event number 88, you'll see how this follows. So now people are saying, I want to follow. Yeah, I want to follow. So what happens now? So Jesus sends the 70. Luke 10, verses 1 to 24. See how it flows? You want to follow? You okay, the disciples, okay. So after the warning to those who would be disciples, he chooses 70 of his present disciples and he empowers them to go out and preach and minister to the people. And so they return reporting that their special gifts were effective in healing and casting out demons. So Jesus reminds them that their time of joy and, and, and security lie in the fact that they themselves are in the book of life. In other words, don't be joyful that you had power and that people listened to you. Be joyful that you're saved. Because you know what? Sometimes your ministry isn't that successful. <laughs> Sometimes your spiritual power is not much power at all. Sometimes you talk till you're blue in the face, nobody cares and nobody listens. Sometimes the church is going great and sometimes it's not going great. So if your you know, power, if your security lies in how successful your ministry is, you're in for a lot of up and down. Because Jesus never guaranteed that ministry would always be successful. He did guarantee it would always be hard. <laughs> it would always be difficult but it wouldn't always be su successful. And so he points them, he says, let your security, let your, the, 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 you know, the center of your joy, let it be in the fact that you yourself are saved. Let that be the center of your joy and your security. Not with the idea you know, that, well, I don't care about anybody else, but you understand what I'm saying? In the end, when you die, when I die, we're going to be alone. I mean, there may be 10 people around the bed, you know, or wherever you are, you know, talking about football. I always found that so strange, you know. So during the death watch, you know what I mean, of great grandma, she's 102, you know, she's, <gasps> she's on her way out, you know, and everybody said, we came to be with grandma at the end. They're talking about OU, and they're talking about hunting, and stuff like that. I guess life goes on, you know what I'm saying? That's what I mean about the idea that when you die, when it's your turn to die, you're on your own, you're alone. Nobody else is dying, they're, all, they're, they're moving on. It's like at a funeral. 
you know, how many funerals, uh, you know, uh, many of you have been to a lot sung, and that, but I've, I've also been to quite a few funerals. And it always was amazing to me that after it's all over and you do the graveside and so on and so forth, you know, smokers pff, light up, phew, finally. I, pff, oh, it feels better. Yeah, where are we going to eat? We're going to you know, go and corral, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, just the dead person stays behind. Yeah, and I don't mean to be facetious now, I'm not being disrespectful, but I mean, of course. We're not going to jump in the hole with them. We're, we're alive, we're moving on. You know, they're the ones that are, that are dying. And so the comfort, the joy, the security that I have is that at that moment when I'm going to be alone, when it's my turn, I, I have the knowledge that my name is written in the book of life. Yes, Bobby. All the coffin are single, yes. <laughs> okay, so he sends the 70. He sends the 70. And now we have the apostles and 70 special disciples who are preaching and ministering in the area. And now they're causing quite a stir and they're preparing for Jesus' final entry into Jerusalem. And that was event number 88. Because they're not just preaching the gospel, you know, people are starting to gather, you know, the storm is gathering, the people are gathering, the crowd is gathering. So number 89, the parable of the Good Samaritan, Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. So during this time, Jesus relates this parable in response to a question from a scribe who wanted to justify himself regarding keeping the law. He thought that the important provisions in the law concerning love and obedience pertained only to and for the, Jew, uh, for the Jewish nation. And Jesus gives the parable of the Good Samaritan to show that God's law is universal and applies to, to all people. All will be judged by God for their obedience to Him and treatment of others, regardless of their relationship. Before God, all are neighbors and worthy uh, of our law. Not everybody is saved, but everybody's our neighbor. You know? Not everybody's saved, but everybody's our neighbor, and, and we are obliged to our neighbor as, as Jesus has taught. Uh, event number 90, Jesus visits Mary and Martha in Bethany, Luke 10, 38, all the way to chapter 11, verse 13. I've mentioned before that Mary and Martha, was, uh, this was Jesus' place to stay when going to teach in Jerusalem. It was only a few miles from the city, the road to Bethany, three miles. Uh, I, I believe, if I saw the sign correct, it, it's three miles from the Garden of Gethsemane to Bethany, three miles. So um, during this occasion, Martha asks Jesus you know, to get Mary to help her. And Jesus shows that being with him is the best choice and he will not take that away from her. Again, a kind of a, you know, a, a teaching moment here. So at the same time, the disciples ask him to help them to pray and Jesus teaches them using another version of the Lord's Prayer that is found in Matthew 6, verse 9. All right, number 91, Jesus cures another demoniac, Luke 11, 14 to 54. Now the cure is hardly mentioned at all. Luke describes more in detail the reaction of the people and the Pharisees concerning the miracle. Because Jesus uh, cast many demons out. It was, it was not a, I mean, it's an unusual thing, but it happened often, so he doesn't mention it. He doesn't give a lot of detail. But people reacted to the miracle. Some accused him of using Satan's power to do miracles and healings, and others wanted more signs. And the Pharisees continued to attack him on points of ceremony and tradition, you know, washing of the hands and so on and so forth. So nearing the end of his ministry, his miracles produced confusion among the doubters and anger among his enemies. It's like it was too much. You know, it's like you're losing. You know, you're, you're on a team, you're playing football, and the other team is winning at halftime 39 to nothing, and by the third quarter they're winning 57 to nothing, and then in the fourth quarter they're all out and they, you know, they're, they're running up the score. You know? So he's running up the score. And his enemies now are like, you know, they're just, they're wild with fury. Because there's absolutely no reasonable 
way that they can deny what he's saying. And so they just, they just fall back into themselves with more fury, more, more anger. And Jesus responds by rebuking them and warning them that they will be condemned and punished because of their discipline. Here's another miracle. You don't believe? You'll be punished. Here, let me give you another miracle. You don't believe? You, you know, this is, this is the, the way it's going. 92, exhortation to His disciples, Luke chapter 12, verses one all the way to chapter 13, verse five. So He's being attacked, He's being opposed by the leaders, the people are unsure of Him. Jesus encourages and comforts His disciples during this difficult period because, I mean, they're being attacked too. And he tells them, be careful of the Pharisees because the way they treated him, imagine how they're going to treat the disciples after he's gone. And he tells them the truth will come out one day. There'll be no confusion. And he tells them, you know, don't be afraid of these men, fear God instead because God has a lot more power. And he encourages them with the idea that God loves them and will care for them. You know, the idea of one sparrow falling, that's where that passage is. And God will provide what to say and how to respond during persecution. So he's starting to prepare his disciples for his death and resurrection and the tough time that is about to come. They don't know it, but we know it because we, we see the whole picture here. And he tells them the parable of the rich fool, you know, bigger barns in order to warn them not to get too tied up into this world. You know, much of his exhortation is similar to early teachings given to them in the Sermon on the Mount. And he also adds uh, new parables during this time as well. One, the slaves who are faithful when their master comes and, 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 and don't let their house be broken into, that parable, and also slaves that act faithfully and honorably while their master is away. And he finishes his teachings with warnings not only to his disciples, but to the people who had gathered to hear him about being prepared. He knows that his coming and resurrection are near, and he wants to warn them that an important time of decision is near as well. You need to decide. You need to decide. Number 93, we're almost done, we've got a few minutes left. 93, the parable of the barren fig tree, Luke 13, six to nine. One more parable, warning of the consequences of not producing fruit. The fig tree in the parable was given extra time to produce, but would be cut down if it did not eventually produce figs. Now, if all of the teaching in parables at this point, Jesus is issuing a warning to those who have not yet accepted Him, who are rejecting Him. It's not like they weren't warned. 94, healing of a woman with a spirit of infirmity. So Jesus is still in the general area of Jerusalem, but He's in a synagogue this time, teaching. Once again, He's faced with the challenge of healing on the Sabbath, but He does so and He rebukes those who would accuse Him of sin for helping a poor woman out of her misery. Luke says that the leaders were humiliated by His rebuke, but the people rejoiced at His answer the healing of the woman with the spirit of infirmity. And isn't it amazing how many times the idea of healing on the Sabbath is an issue? Over and over and over and over again, they, uh, their challenge to him was that he healed someone on the Sabbath. And if you examine those passages, the answer is always the same. One of two things, either, well you do the same, don't you? He says, you circumcise and if it happens to fall on the Sabbath day, well, you do it anyways, you're working. Or if your animal falls into a ditch on the Sabbath day, you'll be there pulling your animal out. And he says, if you'll pull your donkey out of a ditch, you're accusing me because I've released this poor woman who's been suffering this infirmity for 30 years and you're talking about me breaking the Sabbath? Again, the logic was unassailable and they were humiliated. But it's amazing, I found, it's amazing how much people will, if you don't want to believe, the kind of wall you can build. And sometimes it's not just believing in Jesus. Sometimes your conscience speaks to you, the word speaks to you, you know, the, the church speaks to you or me about something and we just keep the wall there. It's amazing how much you know, pressure is required for us to finally acknowledge, wow, this is true, not about Jesus, but sometimes this is true about me. 
like I'm too proud or I'm whatever, whatever I am, you know, there's a million sins, but you know, we'll, 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 we'll resist acknowledging the truth, you know, so far past the time that we ought to be acknowledging what's true about ourselves and moving on. So next week we're going to keep going in this section. Jesus will once again go to the temple to confront the leaders and we'll move on. A couple of lessons and then we'll be done as is our habit. Uh, lesson number one, time does run out. Time does run out. The Jews had 1,500 years to prepare. It seemed that their time would never end, but one day the time ran out. 1,500 years is a long time. God sent prophets, He sent Jesus to prepare them and warn them, but they didn't listen and they were destroyed in 70 AD. He, they even had 30 years, almost 40 years after His resurrection. They still had another four decades of the gospel being preached and miracles being done by the apostles. And they still didn't listen. So Jesus sent His apostles and His preachers in every generation to tell people to be ready. It seems like the Lord will never come, but one day time will run out. So you know, I always encourage people, don't, don't, don't get caught short. We tend to put stuff off, you know, but that time will come. It came for the Jews. And then lesson number two, my last lesson, uh, the time to do good is now. The easiest thing to put off is to do something good. <laughs> to do something good for ourselves, you know what I mean? Good like for spiritually something good. You know, I ought to, whatever, good for myself. Or to do something good for someone else. But whenever the opportunity and the will of God was present, Jesus did good. He healed the people even when it was inconvenient, even when it was dangerous, even when it was unpopular. So the opportunity to do good, to serve, to do right is always, um, is always there, but it's not always convenient, it's not always easy, but we do have to seize the moment. Because you know what? The opportunity to serve the Lord, doesn't, it doesn't come by every day. So we need to seize that when, when, it, when it comes. Please, you know, don't talk yourself out of doing good, or don't talk yourself out of doing the right thing, or don't talk yourself out of taking the next step, whatever the next step is for you, it's different for all of us, you know, but we all know there's a next step to take. Don't talk yourself out of that, because the time to do it is now. The blessing that comes with it is now.